all. So thank you all for joining this morning. Um, I won't spend long. I'm just going to say something for a few minutes um, before we kick off the, the main part of the, the knowledge share. Um, so I'm Neil Menzies. I'm chair of this uh, knowledge share on real estate. Um, I think I've met most people, but welcome um, on this rainy mixed weather Friday. We're just commenting on how miserable it has been middle of June. Um, quick introduction to the knowledge share. Um, around 18 months ago, the CDP Ireland uh, network decided that they wanted to trial sessions around specific sectors as opposed to specific topics. And we chose, I think, four different um, sectors that we would concentrate on, uh, real estate being real estate and construction being one of them. And what we wanted from the, the, the knowledge shares was to expand CDP responders knowledge um, on various topics um, to do with construction real estate, how to improve their responses to CDP, but also open it up to a wider audience um, to assist those who may be thinking about responding to CDP um, if they're not already um, are maybe engaging with their supply chain or their clients who, who are responding to CDP as well to understand the topics that they're dealing with. The format um, is really to have some expert speakers talk on specific topics and then open it up for everyone else to contribute. Now, questions are to contribute uh, their own thoughts on it. So please do at the end of uh, the session today, um, hopefully you can have some comments or topics that you might like to, to discuss uh, about your own companies as well. Um, last year, we did hold one on construction real estate. It concentrated on setting net zero carbon strategies at a business. Um, but we didn't delve into the, the technical detail around how to set the target. And that's what we want to talk about today is about how to set a science based target, which is an important part of CDP, but also important messaging for your, your company to your stakeholders um, as well. And then also delve a little bit deeper into the supply chain side, because obviously if you're setting a science based target, your scope three and your supply chain is going to be a very important part of, of that target. Uh, and we'll hear from an expert around how they're dealing with it day to day in their own business um, as part of the supply chain within the real estate industry. So before I introduce the speakers, just very quickly for anyone who's not aware, there is training next week. This is a, a shout out um, on Monday. There's free training for anyone who wants to upskill around the CDP climate change disclosure. Um, it's free training and it runs from 2 to 3.30 uh, on Monday afternoon. So I'm just going to introduce the, the two speakers at the beginning. Um, we have Lorraine Fitzgerald. Uh, Lorraine has over 20 years experience leading and influencing in the area of sustainability, ESG and stakeholder engagement. With a background in environmental science, she has combined this with excellent communication skills to drive purposeful and dynamic change. And this has included leading and delivering a range of sustainability and climate change strategies and projects for corporates as well as governments and agencies, both in Ireland and in Scotland. Lorraine has been Head of Sustainability with Glenvey Properties since October 2021. And then Fintan Smith um, has been working in the construction industry for over 30 years and has held the role of Building Physics Manager since 2011 for St. Gobain Construction Products in Ireland, focusing on collaboration and leadership in best practice for a sustainable built environment that brings together international and standardization and addressing real world challenge, challenges through building science, research and advocacy in lightweight construction to deliver high performance, long life, low impact, energy efficient, fire safety solutions for new build and retrofit. That's a long winded one, Fenton, but we have to get it all in there. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lorraine. Lorraine is going to talk for 15 minutes um, and then Fenton and then we'll open up to the floor for anyone who wants to um, feed in their own thoughts and comments. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to see some familiar faces. See Mark there. I haven't seen you in, in quite a while. Um, so thanks for the uh, invite, uh, Neil. And um, I suppose I will share our experiences this morning about setting uh, science based targets. I wouldn't say we're I'm an expert necessarily in, in, in that, but I guess um, I can share our experiences and um, how we um, navigated uh, the the science-based target um, journey. So I'm just going to share my slides um, here. And please feel free to um, 
to stop it or to, to ask me any questions either as we go along the way if there's anything really kind of urgent. So just put it on slideshow. OK, so um, just a very brief introduction to Glen Bay for those of us, those of you who don't know us. Um, we're one of the leading home builders um, in Ireland, and our vision is that everyone should have the opportunity to access great value, high quality homes in flourishing communities across Ireland. Um, we typically um, invest across three different business segments. Um, our suburban business is really around um, delivering affordable, high quality homes, um, particularly in the, the greater Dublin area, but um, some broader than that as well um, at, at the moment. So they're typically your kind of, um, I suppose, semi, semi detached um, or terraced houses. Um, then the urban business is generally apartments delivered to institutional investors and state agencies, um, typically in Dublin um, and Cork. And then our partnership business really typically involves government, local authorities, state agencies um, contributing their land um, on a reduced cost or phase basis um, in a development agreement with ourselves. So um, they're the, the kind of three areas that, that, that we would cover. <clears throat> And um, our strategy, which we developed um, a few years ago, building better, um, I suppose, is anchored around that vision. And we've set five um, strategic priorities. And I suppose at this point, we took the opportunity to integrate sustainability into our strategy rather than have a separate um, sustainability strategy with separate pillars, which we had before that. Um, so, as you can see, I suppose our strategy straddles across environmental and social um, issues as, as well as other things. So it focuses on, you know, our customers and our people, but also um, creating those sustainable and thriving places, driving operational excellence and, and innovation. And so things like climate change, biodiversity, circular economy, EDI, all of those things, um, I suppose, weave their way in um, through that um, strategy. But today, I suppose, I just want to focus on um, our journey around science-based targets, um, why we did it, um, what was that journey, what did it look like, what are the science-based targets, um, the verification, and I suppose where we're at at, at the moment. <clears throat> I would say there was probably no one um, driver for adopting science-based targets. I think it was a culmination of things coming together um, that made the decision um, for us. Um, regulation and reporting certainly had um, an influence there. We are subject to CSRD reporting for uh, this year, so happy days. We're all um, tearing our hair out around that one. Um, so definitely that had a driving um, force. We had been reporting around um, CDP for a number of years, and obviously there's a focus there in terms of your net zero journey and your science-based targets. We're also listed on the London Stock Exchange, so that means we're required to um, disclose um, to TCFD as well and have been doing that over a number of years. And again, you know, you don't necessarily have to have it, but, you, you know, when you start disclosing, I think, you know, gaps become evident things then like the Energy Performance Building Directive, again, it's not saying you have to have science-based targets, but I think the introduction of kind of that life cycle assessment and body carbon um, aspect there, I think all of those things coming together, you know, point in, in one direction. Um, investor pressure then, um, I, I don't think it's that investors were specifically saying, you know, oh, you have to set science-based targets, but certainly the conversations that I've had with investors, climate is the main topic of conversation, I would say, followed probably by something like EDI. Um, but certainly investors are asking about your journey, they're asking about your transition, all of those things. And again, that, that fed into um, our decision. Um, when we look across at our peers, um, both inside the home building sector here and in the UK, but also at other sectors, you know, we see a lot of them also adopting science based targets. So, you know, there is a certain element of peer pressure um, that that drives that for us. And I suppose. Also, it's it's really a framework for driving action. I think if you don't have um, targets, and you don't have a transition set out. It's quite hard to drive action internally because 
you know, people might say, well, what, why are we doing this? Or, you know, where are we going? So having that framework for action, I think, is really helpful and really important in terms of driving um, action uh, internally. And we found that, you know, really useful since, since we um, started on this journey. Um, in terms of the timeline, then, um, I suppose it is, um, we're a very young company. We were just floated on the stock exchange in 2017. So, you know, it's, it's everything is quite new for us in, in many respects. And I suppose sustainability, um, while it was threaded throughout a lot of the things that we were doing, um, I suppose it was really in 2020 that we started to specifically look at, you know, climate change and sustainability with a focus. And um in 2020, we had our first disclosure of um, scope one and two emissions and some of the scope three categories. We didn't we didn't do all of them uh, in our annual report. We also had our first CDP disclosure and we had our first TCFD disclosure at a, a very light level. And I suppose it was just a case of, you know, um, trying to put a marker in the sand, really, and trying to, to move on, trying to do something at, at that point. Um, in 2021, then we evolved it a bit further and we had a full disclosure of um, our scope three categories in our annual report. So we did quite a lot of work in 2021 at, um, you know, ensuring that we had all of the right categories covered and ensuring that the information that we had was, you know, quite robust in terms of disclosing our, our scope three categories. We also set a, a climate target at that point around scope one and two, but it was intensity based. And I guess it was just set at the time just to have something to focus on with the knowledge that we'd probably set something um, a bit more ambitious um, after that. Um, in 2022, I suppose that was the year that we did a lot of the work on our science based targets, our net zero transition, and also on the data around scope three. So we were using some um, cost-based factors for um, our, our emissions that we published in, in 2021. And we knew that, you know, they're not very accurate. So we wanted to do a little bit more work in terms of improving the data quality that we had around scope three before we set the um, science-based target. So we spent quite a bit of time in 2022 doing that. We also spent a lot of time around engaging people internally um, and having lots of workshops throughout 2022. So presenting the, you know, kind of the baselines to them, looking at the various different options, trying to get people comfortable really with setting the science based target. Um, and that was, you know, not without its challenges, because in some ways, I suppose it's it's a leap of faith because you don't have all of the answers. So, you know, you're asking people to sign up to a very ambitious target um, and you're, you know, saying, well, we don't know exactly how we're going to achieve it at this moment. Um, so that does take quite a bit of work and engagement um, with people internally. We also signed Business in the Community's Low Carbon Pledge at that point. And that was, um, I suppose, to give an indication that, you know, we were going to, to, to set the targets. And we um, we met our science based target commitment um, as well late in, in, in 2022 to, to give that indication again that we, we were going to set it. So at the beginning of 2023, um, we we um, submitted our application form to um, to the science based targets initiative and. Um, you know, we had a lot of the, the the work done. I don't think the application form in itself is is a huge um, deal. We had consultants helping us um, in relation to that, but most of the work I think had been done in relation to the data and the quality of the data throughout the year. Um, so we submitted that in February of 2023. We published our our net zero transition plan, um, and we published the targets in that in March 2023. We were very clear, very transparent that they hadn't been verified, but we didn't want to wait until verification. We were happy to to publish them um, with that caveat and that we would update them, you know, if, if necessary. But we did want to publish the plan. We did want to set out that to the market, you know, where, where we were going. So we submitted um, the application in 2023. Uh, in February, and we we did get an email straight away to say that verification wouldn't begin until October, and um, so it did it did kind of begin in October, I would say. Um, we had initial uh, interaction with the Science Based Targets Initiative, mainly just around actually invoices and stuff like that, and then it went silent for about five weeks. 
Um, and then it started in earnest in um, probably November 2023. And we had four rounds of queries. Um, we had set both a short term target and a net zero long term target. So we had four rounds of queries. Um, I would say that the queries, you know, with an improvement in the application form, you could eradicate a lot of the queries because a lot of them were essentially things we'd either put in the application form or things that you thought, well, actually, you could have put that in the application form and it would make the whole process efficient for, for everybody. So um, there was nothing kind of major in it. We were able to go back very quickly. Um, we were we were supposed to have a, um, a verification by the 27th of December. But um, uh, we got a, a, an email on the 21st of December, I think, to say that, oh, no, there's going to be one more query after Christmas. So um, we did get a verification in January um, of um, 2024. So, you know, it was almost a year after we actually submitted it. So we got the verification. So it is a bit of a waiting process. Um, I, I would say the verification process is a, is a, it's a bit painful in some ways, not that it's um a, a huge amount of you know work but it's just more so that you know i think those questions could be dealt with in in a different way with a better application form but um in any case we got our science based targets um verified so we were we were happy um with with that um so i suppose just to show you a little bit around kind of what um our our targets consist of and, and what the baseline is um we published this um infographic in our net zero transition plan and it's been very very useful um particularly internally i think at trying to help people to understand where our emissions are because um only two percent of our emissions are in our scope one and two so that's that's really really tiny um and you know that's i suppose what a lot of people internally see but you know 42 percent of our emissions come from that extraction and um, manufacturing processing part of the materials that go into our houses so that's that's a huge you know element for us that is somewhat outside of our control albeit we have influence on it um, but that's where a lot of it happens. Um, another 3% in terms of the transportation. Um, the other big chunk for us is that 22% is due to subcontractor fuel on our sites. So we, we do have a certain amount of fuel use on sites, but obviously we have a lot of subcontractors on our sites um, that do, you know, groundsworks, cranes, um, stuff like that. And that's where a lot of the, the fuel use is actually coming from. Again, um, somewhat outside our control, but we probably have a little bit more control, I'd say, on that rather, um, as opposed to the kind of upstream um, extraction piece. And then the other big piece for us is around the housing use. So it's the um, energy used by our customers when they're in, um, when they're living in their homes over a 50 year period. And that is comprised of both regulated and unregulated. So the regulated is things like the heating and lighting that we have control over to a certain extent. Again, the unregulated we have no control over. So it's people using their, you know, televisions or IT equipment and, you know, washing machines, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, now, there, those percentages are based on our baseline in 2021. They do obviously change a bit. Um, so I think we've seen the um, housing use one go down over the two years, whereas we've seen the extraction and processing one go up in terms of percentage share. Um, but I, I suppose this has been really useful for us to kind of demonstrate kind of where the big um, the big kind of um, challenges and, and indeed the big wins um, can be. In terms of the targets that we've set, obviously you don't have a, a huge amount of choice if you're setting a, a science-based target. So for us, it's a 46.2% a absolute reduction in scope one and two on a 21 um, base year. That's for 31, uh, 2031. And it's a 55% um, intensity reduction then for scope three to 2031 and then it's net zero um so it's 90 percent in in scope one and two and it's 97 percent in uh, intensity in scope three oh, sorry yeah uh yeah um so you know they're they're the ambitious targets um that we've set um i suppose we've tried to set out there the kind of the actions that we would take in relation to achieving those um for the the scope one and two the big one is around transitional sites to renewable fuels um, and we have started that in terms of 
um, rolling out HBO on our sites last year. Um, other smaller things are, you know, transitioning the fleet to EVs, renewable electricity and, you know, increasing efficiencies um, across our sites. Um, in terms of scope three, obviously, because most of our emissions are in that extraction and processing phase and subcontractor, the big things here are supplier engagement and subcontractor engagement. And we've commenced um, a, a whole program of work in relation to engaging our suppliers and subcontractors, not just on climate, but across other things like biodiversity, um, human rights, EDI, circular economy, all of those things as well. Um, the other, uh, I suppose, big element is around innovation in this space. So we have an innovation team. We work very closely with them and they're looking at ways in which we can reduce um, not just our carbon. They're looking at how do we you know, reduce carbon, but reduce cost, do it in an offsite way, reduce waste. So it's kind of all of those things um, together. So, um, you know, that, that takes a bit of time to kind of see the, the outputs um, of that. Um, so I suppose just in terms of our progress then, um, sorry, um, you know, in terms of scope one and two, we knew that we weren't going to make progress um, straight away. And I suppose when we set the targets, it was early 2023, we decided to go with the 2021 um, baseline um, because it's absolute and we had um, increased our output. Um, you know, 2022, we, we have an increase in, in our emissions um, in relation to our baseline. We did reduce in 2023 um, in comparison to 2022, but it's still above the baseline. And that really is due to the fact that we didn't roll out HBO until the second half of the year. We did want to kind of do our due diligence. So we did produce a HBO position paper um, just to set out the guidelines in terms of the type of HBO that we would um, be procuring and the due diligence around that, the certifications that we expect from our suppliers and all that. So we didn't want to roll it out until we had that in place. And then there were a few sites that, you know, were coming to the end um, of their cycle and, you know, the, the kind of operational decision was made that we wouldn't move them at, at, at that point. So um, we do feel, though, that we're well on our way in terms of 2024 in, in reducing um, against, uh, against our baseline. Um, in terms of scope three, we have actually reduced along that trajectory, um, mainly because we have increased the number of A1 houses that we, we have um, delivered. So you can see there at the bottom uh, right in 2021, we didn't have any A1s. Um, it moved up to just over half in 2022. We've 85% now in 2023. So that has had quite a big impact on the um, the occupant energy, the, the, the product in use um, phase. So I suppose we're, we're making good progress there, um, but we're probably almost pushing the end of the envelope in terms of um, that piece. And it, it's really moving more towards the, you know, the extraction and processing of, of um, materials, the sub supplier and subcontractor engagement. And that is a, a really big focus for us this year and will be um, and along with the innovation over the next um, few years in terms of, of um, seeing that. We're conscious as well, I suppose, of, you know, the planning system and how long things take to go through that in that and that, you know, you may not see actual, you know, big reductions in scope three for a few years and then it might be quite, you know, a dip at, at, at that point. But I suppose it's also about, you um, you know, managing those expectations both internally and externally with investors that, you know, you may not see results for, for a little while just because of that long lead in um, process. Um, I've just put in the appendix, I'm happy to share these slides, just the kind of the breakdown of the, the full um, categories that, that we're reporting um, to in relation to um, scope three in particular, maybe of interest to people. Um, but um, I'll leave it there for now. Um, and as I said, happy to take any any questions and uh, not not necessarily an expert, but hopefully um, our journey is, is helpful to to all of you in terms of uh, where you're at at the moment. Brilliant. Thanks, Lorraine. Just while Finton's getting his slides ready. Um, well done on getting your science based target. I know you said, and I quote you, the SBTI application form is no big deal. Um, I'm sure it's not that simple. And, you know, you had your everything you looked in a row beforehand, which is fantastic. Yeah. So it, it does help to you don't just jump straight into this. You've got to take your time. You've got to have some understanding of of where you're at. So 
Um, yeah. Well done. I'd on say that. the application form in itself is is not you know th- that kind of gets filled out once you've all the work done. It's the work yeah. before that that's the big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's what we're gonna kind of let people uh, understand about. So we'll hold questions until after Fintan has has gone through his slides. If that's okay, um, you can drop questions into the chat as well as we go along if you wanted to. Fintan, have you you okay yes, to go? I'm- I'm good to go. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, how you doing? Fintan Smith from Sangaman Construction Products. So, uh, despite the weather, it's, it's very nice here in Greystone, I must say. Uh, so, uh, enjoying that. But also in the Glenvay apartment, I might say. So maybe that's adding to my comfort today. So, uh, anyway, I will. I will uh, throw this up here. Can you see that there? Yeah, we're good. Yep. So, uh, look, Sangaban uh, launched this purpose a number of years ago, and I think I probably got this, uh, given my background in sustainability, it made made perfect sense to me, this, this idea of making the world a better home, which means both addressing the quality and performance of our buildings, but also making sure that that's done in a, in a low impact way to preserve and enhance the, the, the quality of our of this, this, this planet. So that's really what we're committed to as an organization. Um, there's a long history with Sangaban as a as a business. They go back uh, almost 360 years. They did the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, uh, but even locally, gypsum and bricks. Um, so I work for Gibrock and Isover. Um, they go back to 1936 in Ireland, uh, at the top of Meath, uh, bottom of Cavan, Monan. There, so a, a long history. But what does you know uh, business mean in in the 21st century where we are? Well, it's 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 a lot wider. And, and it includes addressing uh, all kinds of employment issues, uh, diversity and inclusion, and, and speaking to you know people, planet, profit, or or social, environment, economic concerns through our our uh, pe- people policies, our, our climate policies, and, and our economic how, how we speak into um, the state requirements now around green public procurement and, and being responsible in that capacity as well. I don't think I need to speak to what we're trying to address here, but it's it's quite daunting when we look at the challenges that are facing the uh, construction industry specifically. Uh, but Sangaban corporately have set out these these targets for 2030, uh, and then obviously working towards net zero carbon by 2050. Th- these are all science-based target initiatives. They're all um, approved, and we have uh, we've been CDP registered now for a number of years. And while it's not it's not continuous. We don't hold A all the time. I think we've got a pretty good track record uh, around climate. We're also uh, maintaining uh, CDP water since 2012. Uh, so we've been doing pretty well globally there as well. Now it's important to say that we are one business unit within Sangaban globally. So all of our reporting is managed at, a, at an international level. So we we just do our part locally to feedback uh, the uh, the numbers to report in, into that that global picture, but then uh, the, the bulk of my presentation is going to be speaking to what we are doing locally in order to achieve those things and what does it mean practically on the ground. So again, we we're, we're conscious that this is not just about climate. Uh, when we look at at the, the planetary boundaries, uh, we've got climate change. We also have water acidification, ozone depletion. And it's interesting that if we look at the life cycle analysis of all of the products that we produce, our, our environmental product declarations, they're measuring a lot of these characteristics. So while today most of our focus is on carbon, for sure, uh, we can't be, we can't have tunnel vision around that. We can't ignore everything else that's going on at the same time because the crisis is quite real. But these also directly feed into what we're trying to achieve as an industry. So this is the role in suit of architects climate challenge targets for for the industry as well in terms of bringing down carbon uh, in in different sectors over the next 10 years. So really what Sangaban has done is to try to integrate CSR within the heart of our business model and that that that's right across uh, all all sides of the activity. So it includes and, and again I'll speak to the local actions. We we've got responsible sourcing certification for the manufacture of all of our plasterboard insulation metal products in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and and that that's about business ethics. We've got top safety records. Uh, we've got zero zero incidents now um, uh, at present. 
we, in, in terms of measuring and tackling climate change, we've got the largest, we're probably best in class for the production of EPDs, environmental product declarations globally. And we've got uh, probably the largest database for a single manufacturer in Ireland as well. Um, so a lot, all of our plant supports and installation um, uh, seem to establish this data and we're, we're increasing our library as we go. In terms of the circular economy, I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, later, but we, we do have a, a take back scheme. So for off cuts of plasterboard, for example, we recover those through dedicated skips so that, that material can be recycled back into the production of new product. Uh, we're not we're not quite yet at a stage where we're taking demolition waste. Uh, there's a lot more to deal with in the context of, of the EPA and their licensing uh, challenges. So we, we work on those, but in the meantime, we keep going. Uh, with, with what we can and obviously a lot of focus around sustainability is is it all starts and, and ends with people so uh, we have to to have a, a just transition and that means uh, that diversity and inclusion has to be also integrated within the heart of our business and and making very good very good strides there in, in terms of uh, measurable change and, and local inclusive value creation as well specific to carbon this is a sort of a carbon bridge, if you like. Uh, many of you have seen this before, but me measuring where we are and, and the various steps that are going to happen, including increases in production uh, over time in order to make sure we achieve our, our targets uh, for, for reduction to 2030 and beyond. Okay, so this is just an example that is taken from our, our global financial report, <clears throat> but it shows you this is how all of the checks and the balances come together around product optimization, performance improvement, innovation, and, and our energy sources, et cetera. And specific then to plasterboard production. So th this is our factory over here. Uh, and, and we're, for example, looking at putting in a PV install on, on the land behind in order to uh, increase that. Right now we have 100% certified uh, renewable electricity supplied to our business anyway, but we'll, we'll be moving away from that as much as we can to, to actually produce the energy on site. Uh, but in, in terms of the steps, the production and what it means to bring down the carbon footprint of any, any form of manufacturing, it really requires looking at every single step on the entire journey to see how can we optimize and improve that, including the recipe for the products, but also every, every uh, element of the finer detail of the manufacturer to improve the, uh, the production. So well, one interesting thing is the, the more we, we increase the recycled content in the product, the more it will uh, require the use of more water in the manufacturing of the plasterboard. And that means more energy than to drive it off. So you, you have these challenges. It's only an example of uh, sustainability is about the trade-offs between all of the things you're trying to achieve. So while recycled content might be a good thing, it, it can drive up carbon at the same time. So it, it's about balancing all of those things to achieve the ultimate end goal. Um, our activity is also very focused on how we support our customers with their environmental accreditation. So using LEED or BREEAM certification for their buildings. So we do that through our APDs, through our BS success one recycling, and then also through our, our, through the health of our products, if you like uh, the health impact. So we have VOC testing for all of our plasterboard and insulation um, as well. But sustainability is, is certainly something that we're never going to be able to tackle on our own. So this is all about partnership. It's all about engagement. So we've been, uh, we've been a gold founding partner of the IGBC since the get-go. Uh, and we work with them um, on a number of initiatives that you can see up here as well. A lot of these are, are also government and wider industry uh, initiatives around energy efficiency, uh, quality of building, uh, et cetera. But, uh, but also around education. So we, we do a special event every year for Green Week. Uh, we're all, we also have our own technical academy where we've trained, I think, 15,000 people now on free courses in energy efficiency and building regulations to improve quality and, and sustainability of buildings. And then we're also driving people engagement through our own business. We have about 250 employees. So we rolled out climate change training through Climate Fresk uh, as, a, as a card game. It's a very good, engaging way to bring people on board and give them uh, the detail around climate change without overloading them, uh, but also looking to see what we can do internally around biodiversity communications and wider community engagement. Again, I spoke to circularity already. Uh, we, we are 
we are uh, seeking to balance the, the impact of the recycled content, drive it up, increase the, vo the volume of, of collection on waste and compliance in that regard, because gypsum can't be going into landfill anyway. But we're also looking at the circularity around our pallets. So we're introducing a new scheme uh, towards the end of the year around pallet um, collections, and that, that, will, that will have a big impact. You would not believe the amount of timber that gets uh, that gets used. Another aspect is, is we have the EPDs for the individual products, but now we're starting to measure, well, um, how, how the impact of, of the individual components, so the metal frames for our walls and ceilings, the plasterboard, how they come together in, diff in different uh, number of layers and combinations, di different sy systems in order to measure the total impact of those. So we're developing the data we have available for customers in order to inform what is the most sustainable way to achieve a certain end goal uh, in terms of performance. A lot of our systems are concerned with fire resistance, acoustic performance, energy efficiency. And so we need to know not just what is the highest performing, but also which is the lowest carbon footprint. Uh, and then as a, as a business, we look to biodiversity, although we don't engage with the CDP uh, on this because a lot of their focus is, is on issues such a, as um, um, palm oil. Uh, it, it's not really related to construction timber as such, so it's not, it's not entirely relevant. We, we, still, we still keep our eye very much on the ball with regard to biodiversity, so we have our our quarry restoration plan. So obviously we've been quarrying gypsum for a, a very long time now up, up in, in Cavan. Uh, and we have our, our mines over, over the land here. So we, we will actually in the, in the relatively near future now be restoring all of that to agricultural land and putting in a lake to enhance the, the biodiversity there. We have our biodiversity policy since 2018. And, and, and th these plans uh, are registered to look at the land use, the water, and the ecology of, of those lands. And also we, we've uh, engaged with the, the development of, of the greenway, which runs behind our factory as well here. So all of the planting, making sure the species are appropriate and making sure that that area is enhanced as, 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 as best we can. Uh, another, another thing we try to do is to, to engage with our local communities, largely focused to be fair around King's Court, but also the, uh, around the country, including the, the Peter McVeigh Trust, and, and also uh, other matters such as uh, apprenticeships, trying to sponsor and, and lead us on. And again, this, this is a bit of a whirlwind, whirlwind tour through, through our activity. But for me, it's really about sustainability is great. And CDP and environmental performance declarations, et cetera, are very important measurements, metrics that we need in order to go. But they will always only give you part of the picture. And it will never matter until we make sure that everything is delivered in a real way on the ground, that it will actually perform, that, that the end, end world performance is, is truly measured and understood. So a lot, of, a lot of the work that I do these days is concerned with uh, fire testing and the integration of, of all of the various elements around plasterboard, the wall system itself, but also uh, in combination with doors and, and services. And, and as much as that might seem like a, a fairly normal thing to do, that, that was actually tested to three different fire test standards and the experts in the laboratory, and they've been going 40, 50 years, they'd never seen this done before. So it's about trying to bring together all of these uh, elements, the science, the detail to make sure this works, to make sure that delivers in the lowest carbon way to achieve these performances. So it's not just about changing the product, it's also about how we build and making sure the detail is there. Because at the same time, we still have to uh, attend to our compliance requirements across the board and, and make sure that, that we're diligent, responsible in that. So this is this is really the, the balance that we seek to maintain between sustainability and then performance of our products and systems. Okay, and that's that's it. So uh, really, uh, probably went quite quite fast through that. But uh, anybody's got any questions? There's certainly more to talk about, um, and, and hopefully, uh, and help. Thank you, Fintan. And thanks, Lorraine, as well, again. Um, that was really interesting. What, what I take away from it is the complexity once you get into science-based targets and you start looking at your supply chain, that's really where, you know, the challenges start. And what well, I was fascinated by listening to Fintan, I know you couldn't cover everything there today, but when you delve into EPDs, and if anyone is looking at the, the, the new science-based target for buildings, um, you're going to have to set a target on operational side and on the 
kind of embody carbon or the whole of carbon side of the the your building as well which really is about your materials um as part of your construction process and it'll be unavoidable not to engage with your supply chain your contractors on site and their subcontractors and where the materials are coming from and as much as you might have a target up here at a high level right down on the ground Finton is dealing with lots of other challenges and his supply chain and it becomes very very complex indeed um so i, I have a few questions but i'll, I'll hold it I, i'd like to open the floor because we, we only have around 15 minutes i don't want to hold people too far over 11 o'clock on a friday so um please if people have questions or comments or like to contribute to, to what they've heard please do jump in now Sorry, I have one question for Lorraine. It's Mark Prendergast here from CRH. And Lorraine, you mentioned there when you went off to look at your scope three emissions, you went from a very, I suppose, generic high level uh, look at your scope three down to a more granular level. Did you end up going to product specific um, EPDs or LCAs to get the information you needed to find a factor for converting your quantities of purchased goods from your suppliers to um, uh, scope three emission? Yeah, so what we did was we used a few kind of test house types, typical house types that we have, and we did um, we did LCAs on those. So um, we kind of took two semi detached, one table frame, one block and brick, and then two um, two terraced houses as well. Um, so we. We put them through one click LCA and where we did have, um, you know, materials that we knew had EPDs, we used those um, for them and otherwise we knew, we used generic ones. And then we extrapolated that um, based on the number of, based on the, the square meter of the, of the houses in a particular year. We will like move towards, you know, doing LCAs for all our developments um, at, at some point, but we're just not quite there yet. So we just wanted to, get it as good as we could, um, uh, you know, so so get as much detailed information uh, as we could because we have that really detailed bill of quantities, you know. Yeah, yeah no, just, uh, my, the problem we have is <clears throat> it, uh, it's the size of scale. I mean, we have 120,000 suppliers, you know, getting uh, information from that is impossible. Um, yeah. So did you rank and scale the, the suppliers that most affected your business and picked on the the you know i mean did a kind of materiality on their scale and identify those first off we're doing that now so for for the the lta's we basically put the bill of quantities in you know so we used all of that but what we're doing now is we are you know doing that very thing ranking and scaling our, our um suppliers based on spend but also based on like the impact that they might have environmentally or socially because of csrd and we are going to start targeting those those ones that fit into that kind of um high level like so we have a lot of suppliers as well but like 80 percent of our spend is probably on 25 big suppliers yeah. you know so yeah. that's where we'll start because there's no point going down to the kind of the man in the van and I suppose we're we're very conscious as well of not overburdening. You know, we we work with lots of really small, particularly subcontractors, which we would feel is very important from a social sustainability point of view. And we're just very conscious of not overburdening them with kind of really complex asks. Um, yeah. you know, we'll start with the bigger companies. You know, who a lot of them will be doing you know CSRD or they'll be in CDP or whatever anyway. Um, so we'll we'll start with them. I, I, that's all. Come in there as well. I, I think what Lauren said there is really important. Um, we we have to balance all of these requirements. It's not it's not only carbon. We can't forget about compliance, performance, relationships, people, and and the system as a whole. The, the construction industry took a big knock from COVID. We lost a lot of labour. We need to preserve and enhance and and support each other as an industry. But also to be very careful of the metrics, because the thing that scares me the most, as long as I've been in the world of sustainability and energy efficiency, indeed, 
is the metrics are very flawed. They're very limited. They're very crude instruments and they don't tell you everything that's going on. And it's also very easy to hide behind things uh, sometimes. And, and that can lead to mismeasurement or bad game playing uh, at, at its worst. And so I just I would say be careful with being overly reliant on, on individual numbers as your, as your primary decision maker. You've got to take things in balance. Uh, for sure, because the, the EPD, a lot of a lot of the measurements behind those EPDs are still generic. You know, when you take, we might have our local production of GP, uh, gypsum, but the the carbon footprint of that local production isn't measured in terms of the rock. That's a generic global figure for what it takes to extract a kilo of, of gypsum. And so it's all based, a lot of that is based on generic data and then it's down to your local energy efficiency and so on. But I've seen, let's just call it unusual discrepancies between different manufacturers and the data, which doesn't stack up. At the same time, it doesn't remove our requirement to continue to measure and to do our best to bring down everything we can. And that's where we go as an industry, but it's just to be, to keep that in balance is, is, the, is the key. Yeah, I'm not wanting to extend that conversation any further, uh, but I would inherently believe that, you know, scope three to a degree is flawed because it is, as you say, based on generic factors from others, their weighted averages, their combination of an industrial, international industrials numbers versus a local uh, production facility. And uh, I suppose it's a scale of measuring your impact on other businesses, but not necessarily the, the, um, uh, the main outcome, you know, at the end of the day, I think the scope one and the scope two are, are the key elements and drivers. And sometimes I feel there's a little bit of uh, overemphasis being put on scope three uh, from where it, it, it's coming from. But it, it is it is a measure. And yes, as you say, it's potentially there are flaws in it and it needs probably a little bit more scrutiny and other elements of your businesses need better scrutiny. As we're seeing from CSRD now, you know, you're being hit on all sides on, you know, you've, you've, you have your five ESRSs that we're, our team we're looking at at the moment. And uh, at least we have a derogation for a year. Uh, we don't have to report until 2026. Well, our listing uh, moving to the States last year uh, enabled that to happen. And uh, I God love anybody who's trying to do their CSRD at the moment. And it is a, a particularly difficult minefield to wade through, but that's not what we're here to talk about now. Mark, I'm not hearing anything. Yep. Yeah, very good. Long time no see, Fintan. How's the form? <laughs> Doing very well. Good. Um, I just, I really liked your uh, waterfall of um, where you're going along and you'd integrated in the growth in red and then the subsequent um, reduction. And I suppose I'm always interested in how do you couch growth in this conversation and whether you've had any experience of how do you measure or predict what the growth is going to be in a in a way that satisfies the boardroom and also satisfies other stakeholders yeah we look we we, we do that as a business in financial terms we have been doing that for a long time uh, so this is this is a way of of assessing that that works. Of course, you don't have a, a crystal ball, but you you look to all of the available data. You see what's going on nationally, and you try to try to give it your best stab as to what what you think the future might hold. Uh, but it has to be included. We can't ignore it because yeah. our bottom line is you know there's science based circuits. That's that's what we're committing to, irrespective of growth. That's where we need to land. So um, so yes, we we've got to we've got to do our best to include that. And, uh, but and, I, yeah, I, I think I think I think the 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 integrity behind that stacks up. I think I think the investors really appreciate. I think they really get that. Uh, and look, this this whole thing is a collaborative exercise. We're all in this together, and that includes the yeah. investors, of course. Yeah, and I suppose I was interested. You know, you let's say the the integrity piece. I think that's of course very important, and you could. Um, predict lower growth. I, I, I guess I'm just interested in that tension between you want to tell investors that you're a business that's growing, while at yeah. the same time you do want your SBTI. Um, and so they're like they're they're competing 
um, incentives. And would SBTI, for example, have had any query over the validity of that growth projection or an opinion on it even? Okay, so my, my role within the business, I can't speak to that, to be fair, yeah. but I, I, I've been through enough audit processes to, to understand that, yes, that, that's going to be part of the journey. Maybe Lorraine would have more direct involvement in that, but, but I, 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 would, I would trust that those processes exist, Mark. Uh, that, that's, that's where I would come from. Okay, great, thanks. I think that's a challenge, full stop, and especially in the real estate industry, it's so, you know, up and down, um, and especially setting absolute targets. You know, you can ramp up. I see it from our own business. You know, we had two years ago, we had zero scope three missions around construction because we didn't we didn't build anything for a year. Last year goes up by almost 2000 tons um, as we start a new project. So the onus is on us is to make sure that we're engaging our contractors to reduce their emissions. But realistically, we're only at the measuring stage now and then starting to have those discussions on new projects, going to design stage, going, okay, how can we make sure that the embodying carbon of, of new projects is, is lower and where where are we going to have the, the most impact? But we're, you know, that is the biggest challenge for anyone, especially on the development side, is to understand, you know, maybe now I'm not developing too much, but two years is going to ramp up, five years it could come back down again. And, you know, projections are, impossible to make in, in certain sectors and real estate at the moment. Um, you can, you housing can look is at... always going to be required and, you know, I'm sure that there's an upward trajectory there based on what Ireland needs to achieve. But um, speaking, just speaking from, you know, the office sector has been decimated the last couple of years. So uh, we don't know where that's going to go uh, in the next five to 10 years. So it's really hard to, to predict. And I know, is anyone setting and looking at the, the real estate version of science based target? We've been holding off as a company to, we didn't, haven't set a science-based target because we, we knew this one was coming down the line. It's in beta version at the moment. It's been tested by a number of um, uh, industry groups and consultants. Uh, hopefully later this year, it will be released. And it's, it's totally different. It's breaking completely from the traditional science-based target approach in that you'll have to set an operational intensity target and a embodied carbon target um, separately. And i say it's a complete break from the norm. It probably will suit more real estate companies. Um, but just interested to hear has anyone else had a look at that to see um, how it impacts their businesses, if they're interested in, in taking it on. I was hoping that today we would be able to talk about that, but it's still too early days. Um, no one really understands how to go through the whole process of this new, new guidance on it. Maybe one for a later, a later knowledge share. Um, if anyone has doesn't have any more questions, I can give you back some time on a Friday. Um, to say thanks to to Finton and Lorraine for their time today. Uh, thank you everyone else for joining. Please give us any feedback that you have. Um, anything you'd like to hear from future knowledge shares as well. Um, we probably break from the. About the carbon, yeah, Mark. You're gonna have uh, just, just a, a quick query whether we could get access to those slides. There were some really interesting ways of treating data and visualizations. Uh, climate fresk, actually, Pinton. Um, I hadn't come across that before. That's interesting. This, this is interesting. I did my um master's too long ago, uh, more than 15 years ago, <laughs> and and I did a paper on climate change training because I was concerned about how we bring people on the journey because it can be very emotionally challenging. You can either retreat or or, or lean in, and, and sometimes you can lean in too hard if you take it too much to heart. So how do we do this? So this mm. is a program that was developed by a lecturer in France and saint have taken it on board and rolling it out to 170,000 employees. It's a half-day workshop, three-hour workshop, and basically it's a card game. You give the cards to the to the group of 10, 12 people, and they figure it out. So basically, eight at a time, eight cards at a time. They will say cause and effect, and they teach themselves climate change. And then you have these big eye-opening moments, and uh, and people sort of sit down in shock. And then you have a discussion about well, what are, where are we going to go from here? And and it's going to be okay. And we're going to, we're going to figure it out. And it's it's very good. And I think we've got to create that baseline engagement with everybody. Because it, 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 it otherwise, so I, I, so we're actually looking to maybe start to roll this out through our academy publicly, 
uh, and, and, and maybe starting with an event for Green Week. Uh, so we haven't talked to the IGBC yet, but but uh, we, 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 so yeah, keep your eye on the space. But it but it's really available and there are climate trust groups available in Ireland who do this already and, and even, yeah. even locally. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And you said, so Neil, you said the, the um, presentations will be circulated? Yeah, thanks, yes, Lorraine and Fintan are happy to. We'll share them afterwards as well with everyone. Yep. yep that's awesome. fine. Yeah. Thanks so much. And Lorraine, I know there's, is it next week, next Tuesday, there's a net zero carbon discussion through this um, sustainable supply chain school um, on Tuesday morning, I think. Yeah, I can't remember the date now, but yeah, we can, I can dig that out as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty. There's constantly. There's loads of stuff. Yeah. Had. Yeah. It's, it's finding time to give up with everything is the problem. Yeah, exactly. OK, well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Lorraine and Fintan for your time this morning. Um, a reminder again that CDP training is on next Monday afternoon for anyone who wants to learn more about the new CDP portal, which is confusing, I have to say, just from a quick look, but I'm sure I'll get my head around it. Um, and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for joining.